Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Our next speaker is uh, Francois Meltzer, who is Professor of Religion and Literature and of the Philosophy of Religion in the Divinity School, and Mabel Green Myers, Professor of the Humanities in French and in Comparative Literature. She specializes in postmodern critical theory to analyze literary representations of the subject. Her books include Salome and the Dance of Writing, Hot Property, The Stakes and Claims of Literary Originality, and For Fear of Fire, Joan of Arc and the Limits of Subjectivity. Recently, she edited with David Tracy the Symposium on God for the Journal of Critical Theory. When I asked her how she got into the Divinity School, she said it was a mystery to her, but it had something to do with David Tracy. If he <laughs> explains it, then she will also know. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Meltzer will speak on Baudelaire Maestro and hyper-Augustinianism. sherbet that people sometimes serve at a very fancy dinner to sort of clear your head, your palate, and have a little light repast. Well, as I am sandwiched, as it were, between Professor Magnon and Lawrence, I would like to think of this as sherbet. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Clark Gilpin and um, Susan Schreiner in particular for putting together such a great conference. And of course, for better or for worse, this is for David, my dearest friend, from whom I have learned so much and who has changed the course and nature of my work. Whether or not this is a good thing, uh, you'll have to see, or I'll have to decide perhaps later. Um, what I want to do then is really quite different from what's been done before, um, both because Augustine is hardly my forte uh, but he is, interestingly, in something that I'm working on now, which is a book on Baudelaire. Uh, what I want to do is to demonstrate the extent to which Baudelaire is extremely turned around, influenced in the middle of his career by the fanatical Augustinian Joseph de Maistre, and in particular the latter's notion of uh, original sin. Indeed, I'm going to argue that you cannot understand the text of the later Baudelaire, certainly not his poetics, otherwise. But that in itself is not, to use one of David Tracy's favorite words, very interesting. <laughs> um, I want to go further and argue that it is Baudelaire's bleak view of the world that draws him to domestic in the first place. For the latter has a dark vision that Augustine, for example, did not share. There is no praise, for instance, in this. Uh, but the poet, Baudelaire, did. And I want to suggest that the concept of evil itself in Baudelaire ends up sublating his radical binary structures, such that, for example, Satan and God are often conflated, and evil <coughs> becomes inevitable. Until 1852, Baudelaire was under the sway of the socialist father of anarchy, uh, Pierre-Joseph Boudon, who on the face of it could not have been more different from the right-wing nest. And yet it is Boudon who spends a lot of time on the hypothesis of God, as he puts it, which he decides he has to keep, and who announces famously that God is evil. By which, by the way, I mean, this has been, as you can imagine, scandalously received, by which he meant that a reliance on predetermination and the status quo as the presence of God assumes for him will not solve the ills of poverty, disease, and social inequality. Obviously, I don't have time to go into the don't here. Suffice it to say, however, and I'd be grateful if you'd sort of keep this in mind, that whereas Baudelaire is typically thought of as having been on the left until just after the revolution of 1848, and then on the right, upon reading Mest shortly thereafter, 
I want to say that the poet retains a good deal of Proudhon's ideas on God, even as he becomes the disciple of Mestre, and that he carries with him and in his texts a double and ultimately contradictory vision that has, I think, been insufficiently recognized in the numerous, indeed endless, works on Baudelaire. Uh, and Baudelaire, of course, is always seen as the founder of modernity, as you know, begun in Benjamin. Um, but the obsession with the concept of sin and hyper-Augustinianism by way of Maistre is what allows Baudelaire to write the city less as a theoretician of modernism mm -hmm. than as the producer of texts that form the inevitability, indeed, the triumph of evil. Uh, and this is very, uh, I mean, this is a rather nuanced problem in, in Baudelaire, which I'm going to be talking about here. Um, it is in this sense, I should add, that the flowers of evil have in fact been misunderstood, um, as Baudelaire himself lamented. Though he does revel in notions of corruption and wickedness to some extent, there is also a way in which Baudelaire's conviction that man is by definition irrevocably sinful, um, uh, and that is confirmed in the poet's depictions of the modern capitalist industrial city. So his pleasure then is not only in the freedom of debauchery, it is also and more importantly in the affirmation of his deepest belief that man can never escape his sinful heritage. Well now for this reason saw the flowers of evil as deeply moral, a view he was pretty much alone in upholding. Mm -hmm. Scholars of Baudelaire have long noted his obsession with duality, which is not a very impressive insight since it's impossible to read Baudelaire without noticing the continual reference to binaries, doubles, and contradiction. What everyone forgets in all this recent discussion about rights, notes Baudelaire around 1855 and in huge capital letters, is the right to contradict oneself. It is a right that he exercised flagrantly throughout his life, he accepts dualism as a matter of human course, at least intellectually. Bolea <laughs> is consistent in his will to contradiction and his work rests, uh, resists chronological labeling. These contradictions are deployed by the poet in every aspect of existence, everyday life, politics, social class, historical events, religion, philosophy, love, psychology, textual and poetic production, style, to name a few. These antinomies are willed formally as well as intellectually, and they are telescoped, as Benjamin might have put it. In other words, they collide. Baudin himself was, of course, fully aware of dualities and doublings in his own work and in the everyday life of modernity. Who among us, he writes in the preface to Asimov's um, Revi, is not an homo duplex. I am referring, he says, to those whose mind has been touched with pensiveness, which is to Quincy, always double, action and intention, dream and reality, one always harming the other, one usurping the other's share. This is the part of telescoping or colliding of which Baudelaire was, as I said, entirely cognizant. As he puts it, the artist is an artist only on the condition of being double and of being unaware of no phenomenon in his double nature. The reference is to Buffon again. The obsession with duality in Baudelaire is regularly demonstrated by the remark he famously notes down in his journal, quote, there are in man, every man, two simultaneous postulations, one toward God and the other toward Satan. These postulations, as he puts it, of a, a simultaneous Ascent and descent are further complicated by the fact that he says descent is a joy and is connected with love for women and, quote, intimate conversations with dogs and cats. <laughs> Interesting, as David would say. The quotation shows that Baudelaire has no illusions about mankind. Not only is he given to evil, but he enjoys it. Baudelaire remembers his Buffon correctly, and it's hardly surprising. The passage can only have had great resonance for Baudelaire with respect to his own experience. In Buffon's Discourse on the Nature of Animals, there is indeed a section titled Homo Duplex. And here Buffon writes, 
The internal man is double. He is comprised of two principles, different in their nature and opposite in their action. The soul, that spiritual principle, principle of all knowledge, wages perpetual, perpetual war with the other animal principle, which is purely material. End quote. The result is an internal conflict and writes before in a manner that's almost proto hegelian quote, the two persons oppose each other and the two principles manifest themselves by producing doubts, anxiety, and remorse. Buffon paints man as always prey to equally potent forces with the ensuing equilibrium necessarily creating what he calls confusion, irresolution, and misery. Here lies, writes Buffon, the difficulty of reconciling man to himself, for he is composed of two opposing principles. Nothing could be closer to Bourdieu's notion of man, of existence, than this fundamental duality that is both irresolvable and constant, an equilibrium which is permanent since neither side, neither of these two persons, as Buffon puts it, is any weaker than the other. Such fights between two persons come back constantly in his corpus. Fighting between two persons, for example, is the crux of the odd prose poem, Asamoe Pov, Let's Beat Up on the Poor. You may, some of you remember this, where um, a poor man is beaten up by the narrator who is then beaten up by the poor man. But if Baudelaire instinctively agrees with Buffon's two irreconcilable irre uh, principles in man, we should remember that the poet adds another layer to the conflict, those two postulates that I mentioned, one toward God and one toward Satan. The choice, God or Satan, inscribes the equilibrium between these forces with one of Baudelaire's most consistent beliefs, original sin as the root of all aspects of human existence. The equilibrium can be no better resolved in this context since sin will always trump any move toward the good, and the good will frequently turn out to be enjoying its own descent towards Satan, or indeed turn out to be Satan. The repercussions of such a view on his own literary judgment, for example, are quite distinct for Baudelaire. Georges Sand, for example, is a créature stupide, he writes in his journal, because she thinks, quote, a real Christian cannot believe in hell. That is because, he adds, she is in fact possessed by the devil, <laughs> who makes her believe in, quote, good hearts and good sense, so she can convince others in turn of the same ridiculous idea. In another passage, Wood now wonders about the nature of the fall. Quote, if it is unity become duality, then it is God who fell. In other words, couldn't creation itself be the fall of God? Is God playing his own Lucifer here, or is Lucifer now God, given the fall? Well, Rousseau, as a result of this, Baudelaire says, is an idiot because he believes in the natural goodness of man. Moreover, Rousseau says Baudelaire was overcome by his own moral value and was quite naturally stoned, stoned as in not lapidary business. Um, stoned, he adds, without the need for hashish. We see in these examples um, in Baudelaire's literary judgment the alternating back and forth between categories of good and bad, but alternating to such an extent that the two categories become entirely destabilized, which is, of course, the point. Thus, Maurice Blanchot describes Baudelaire's imagination as, quote, an equilibrium in perpetual disequilibrium. <coughs> now, the opening of Augustine's Confessions had to have intrigued Baudelaire, for there are, as you remember, uh, this grappling, passages with grappling with conundrum of the infant's innocence versus irremediable birth into sin. Who can tell me the sin I committed as a baby, Augustine asks God, for in your sight no man is free from sin, not even a child who has lived only one day on earth. Was it a sin to cry when I wanted to feed at the breast? These remarks serve, of course, as the existential landscape from which the confessions unfold. But for Baudelaire, this is the question that he unendingly asks and can never resolve. 
Even when man appears at his most innocent, even as a child, he is by nature, says Baudelaire, following Mest, following a strange view of Augustine, sinful. Philosophy and religion, writes Baudelaire in Him to Make Up, 1863, order us to feed our old and infirm relatives. But he says nature is nothing other than the voice of our self-interest. It is nature that commands us, moreover, to beat up on these same relatives. It's the same verb, asomi. So we are back to physical struggles. Every happy moment in Baudelaire speaking of beatitude is either erased or at least compromised by an unhappy one, as if punished by the rearing of evil's many heads or punished by the hope in itself of beatitude. Innocence is never genuine, even when it appears so, as, for instance, in a child. There is a prose poem called Regetto from 1862, where the narrator begins with a rare sense in Baudelaire of lightness, légèreté, and something very close to happiness. Vulgar passions, he tells us, seem distant along, distant along with hatred and profane love. The beauty of the landscape is such that, the narrator tells us, something happens in his soul. But then the two uh, poor children in the poem viciously battle for a piece of bread, the narrator of the poem, in his state of peaceful contentment and generosity, had given one of them. Neither little savage, he says, wants to sacrifice a bit of bread for his brother. Being of equal strength, they fight until they're both exhausted. Panting and bloody, the two little boys, who are so alike they could be twins, he says, realize that the object of their battle no longer exists. The bread has been scattered into crumbs, quote, like the grains of sand with which it was mixed. <coughs> this fratricidal war ruins the beautiful landscape for the narrator and destroys as well his sense of peace. Once again, Rousseau is willfully slammed, but that is only part of the story. The protagonist of this poem is Original Sin, which emerges triumphant and inexorable. Now, Baudelaire had become quite conservative by the time he wrote this poem. Um, in fact, despite the happy tenor of the opening of this, this work, um, he carefully prepares the reader for its inevitable morose conclusion. Uh, to begin with, of course, nature is almost never a simple word in anybody, and especially in the Bulgarian lexicon. And the moods it elicits are rarely to be trusted. So I, I don't have time to go into this, but the way the poem opens seems very lovely, but there are little moments that are worrisome. Um, the narrator, for instance, turning to what had been a charming scene into something beginning to resemble the opening of the fall of the House of Usher, <laughs> sees the shadow of an occasional cloud pass over the lake like, quote, the reflection of an aerial giant's coat. The little lake, which turns out to have no bottom, and the narrator's sense of purity of soul are completely buckled by the confrontation of the reality of mankind. In the essence of laughter, which Baudelaire wrote in 1855, he analyzes the dual nature of laughter, notice dual, and responds to an imagined protest on the part of the reader because he puts children in a bad light. Quote, the laughter of children, they think, is like the blooming of a flower. But here, too, children are compared to the apparent beauty of nature, so it behooves the reader of Baudelaire to be suspicious. And indeed, nature returns as an idiomatic um, uh, metaphor. The laughter of children does indeed differ from the contentment of animals because children are not entirely devoid of ambition, unlike animals. That is, little men are unripe Satans, he says. They sat on on them. Like the brothers' bloody battle for the bread, the fundamental evil of children is unavoidable. They are unripe grain, but they will be Satan's harvest in the end. In both Rigetto and the essay on laughter, we see the later Baudelaire didactically demonstrating, as he will do again and again, how one must not succumb to illusions of purity, innocence, goodness, or even happiness. There may be two simultaneous postulations in man, 
But original sin is always at the bottom of it all, a sort of what I would call Unterziehung, that unlike Hegel's Aufhebung, which lifts up even as, as it preserves the dialectic, similarly preserves the two simultaneous postulations while descending them into ever lower confrontation with man's inexorable evil. The unicity of original sin, unum est origine, in the words of the Council of Trent, will always overwhelm the proliferation of dualities. Original sin, then, with the dialectic of good evil, functions structurally in Baudelaire, like Nietzsche's overly cited Apollo Dionysus dualism. Apollo, you remember, steps out of the Greek chorus as the principle of uh, individuality, uh, only to be reabsorbed into the chorus at the play's end. So the good can suddenly emerge, shock-like, in Benjamin's sense, in Baudelaire, only to be returned to the primal soup of evil. If Nietzsche's Dionysian is close to Schopenhauer's notion of the all-consuming will, Baudelaire steps into such an economy with his own notion of le mal. The joy of descent, as Baudelaire puts it, is often a kind of embrace your fate in his text. If there's any progress in any given struggle for Baudelaire, and progress is another word that's very fraught, which I can cut that another time, it is not the inexorable move towards spirit um, in Hegel, nor that toward uh, the communitarian ideal in Marx or Proudhon. For Baudelaire, progress is the inevitability of descent. It is, as he writes in his work on Poe, that great heresy of the crepitude. Baudelaire's little men in their ghetto fight no less ferociously than the future lord and his bondsman, bondsman in Hegel, but there is no advancement to be gained from that vicious struggle, no higher ground to which a new dialectic can be lifted up, and the conflicting forces remain of equal strength and thus afford no happy resolution, no matter how distant. It is man's inherent evil, in other words, that causes the struggle, and it is evil that will win by simple virtue of the presence of the struggle itself. Le Gâteau performs the clash of antinomies at two main levels, then first the two little brothers who fight over the piece of bread until they're too bloody to continue. That struggle one might call the concretization of the second, which is original sin as against man's illusion of and desire for happiness and goodness. This is the reading Baudelaire gets through next. Original sin, in other words, is for Baudelaire the engine motivating the conflict even between children, causing the contradiction between the thought of the good and its constant defeat in the face of man's heredity of evil. It is the same contradiction that motivates the passage we considered from the Confessions. Even as a baby, man is sinful in the eyes of God. Quote, no man is free from sin, not even a child who has lived only one day on earth. So Baudelaire's frequent recourse to children who demonstrate their potential for, for evil is as if a reminder to himself not to be taken in by the seductive promises of goodness. For him, it will always be a promise broken. Another of Augustine's phrases from the Confessions can only have been endorsed by our poet. If babies are innocent, it is not for lack of will to do harm but for lack of strength. And that's a perfect description of Bleu Gâteau. The passage that follows in Augustine is as if an earlier version, two of Gâteau, I have seen, I think David mentioned this the other day, writes Augustine, jealousy in a baby and know what it means. A toddler is jealous when his baby brother immerses at the breast, though there is abundant milk. Can this be innocent, asked Augustine, to object to a rival desperately in need and depending for his life on this one form of nourishment. Again, you can read Asamoni Bull precisely on these lines. Such faults are not mere picadillos, since they are intolerable in adults. Equilibrium will always yield to or be rooted in evil. The dialectic in Baudelaire is most often, with some exceptions, the performance of that fact. It is a dialectic that is sublated by evil, of which it is already the symptom. It follows quite logically, then, that it is virtue that is artificial and evil, which is effortless and natural. 
Consider, for example, the following passage uh, in The Painter of Modern Life. Crime writes Baudelaire, the taste for which the human animal acquired in his mother's belly is originally natural. Virtue, on the contrary, is artificial. Note that this is not Augustine's notion that uh, the vice of malice, for example, is not natural against nature because we are created without evil, even if some of us become evil, but then God uses this to good and so forth. No, none of that. Uh, Baudelaire is willing to see nature in itself as an indifferent given at best, it is man, however, who is naturally evil, who has the will to evil, as Augustine puts it, or in Baudelaire's terms, has no will at all, and is thus doomed. Evil is done without effort, he writes, naturally, by fatality. It follows, then, that the good must always be the result of an art, he says, because that takes effort and is artificial. The essay on the beautiful, which precedes the one on makeup, uh, which make the same point, apply the same perspective. The beautiful is comprised of two parts, the eternal on the one hand, and a more relative circumstantial element, a period, style, moral passion, he writes, on the other. Without this contemporary aspect, the beautiful, which Baudelaire compares to a divine cake, would be indigestible. The eternal aspect of art is thus at once veiled and expressed, he says, by this duality, either by style or by particular temperament of the author. So to explain this double aspect of art, Baudelaire alludes again to the homo duplex in Buffon's terms. Quote, the duality of art is the fatal consequence of the duality of man. And continuing in Buffon's own dialectic, Baudelaire says that the eternal aspect of art is, quote, like the soul of art, and the uh, variable element is like its body. For him, he says, the beautiful, the beautiful is best described by Stendhal, who says, quote, the beautiful is but the promise of happiness. If the promise of goodness and is always to be broken, and if happiness in the human realm is always to be disappointed. Then, at least the beautiful, and for Baudelaire this means, as you know, primarily art and literature, can give a fleeting hope for joy. Sorry, I can't be more upbeat about this, you know. <laughs> the way Baudelaire manipulates dualities performs a conceptual anti-metaboly, a type of anti-metathesis. The position of the antithesis is inverted such that evil becomes natural and virtue artificial. Makeup is more virtuous when caked on, and caked on obviously, than when pretending to be natural, and so on. Bornell's dualities, in other words, manifest themselves in stylistic as well as conceptual contradiction and anti-metaboly, as if original sin were counterintuitive. Quote, I was a baby, and yet. And one had to be forcefully reminded by wrenching everything palpable into its opposite, lest one lapse in Baudelaire into unaccepted because self deluded <coughs> contentment. We noted earlier the repercussions of original sin on Baudelaire's literary judgment with respect to Rousseau and Georges Sand. He was equally disappointed in Hugo's Les Misérables and um, said that he was surprised that Hugo, quote, is for man and yet not against God. He has confidence in God and yet he's not against man. These are sentences that can only be understood in the light of Baudelaire's unshakable belief that original sin is at the basis of everything. If you are for man, then you will no doubt be against God, goes this logic. The most obvious example of this approach is, of course, uh, Voltaire, for whom the earthquake in Lisbon proved the incompatibility of a loving God, given that the horrors of natural disaster can only have been produced by his hand. If, on the other hand, you're for God, then you believe that man must necessarily deserve the tragedies which are visited upon him regularly. In any case, concludes Baudelaire, egotistical happiness go back again to the problem of the attitude, needs to be dragged by the hair occasionally by a poet or philosopher and have her nose rubbed in the blood and odor she produces. So much for the attitude. 
Thus does Bonaire try to find reasons to applaud a book he hates, namely Les Miserables, or and he uses Antimetaboli to make the point, the figure of speech most favored by Joseph de Mestre, the highly conservative Catholic thinker and brilliant stylist who, Baudelaire claimed, taught him how to think. Now I'm going to spend a, a few minutes on Mestre. Baudelaire well, began reading him between 1851 and 1852, and mainly read uh, Mestre's Soirée de Saint-Pédésbourg, uh, Evenings in St. Petersburg, which I'll refer to as the Soirée. As was often the case, Baudelaire was completely smitten, as he famously was, for example, when he first read Poe, or heard Wagner. First, conceptually, Mestre provides Baudelaire with a system for this idea of evil and its inescapability. Original sin, <coughs> writes Mestre, is a notion that, quote, explains everything and without which nothing can be explained. One of those little grains that will be harvested by Satan, I trust him. <laughs> <laughs> believes that original sin is afflicted with repetition compulsion since that sin of all sins unfortunately repeats itself at every instant of time as says the Count in who's the Mestre spokesman in the Soiree. Mestre in other words conflates original with actual sin and this Baudelaire will follow for Mestre the problem has to do precisely with again doubling you will agree, says the Count to his interlocutors, that every being which has the faculty to propagate itself can but produce a being similar to itself, that is, a degraded being, such as man, for example, and cannot but produce an equally degraded being. Children are doomed, and it follows, therefore, quote, Mestre, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is the most dangerous sophist of his century because he thinks nature and man are by definition good. So you see, it's exactly the same argument. Mestre, that soldier animated by the Holy Spirit, as Baudelaire called him, writes in something like aphorisms couched in powerful, almost muscular contradiction. It is a brilliant style, capable of intriguing the lights of Bonaparte, of uh, Sioran, of uh, Klosowski, Bataille, Roger Caillois, all of them have commented on this. Um, one can imagine how Baudelaire, exhausted by his constant need for money, suggestible in every domain, unsure in all matters except that of his own poetics, and even that not always, overwhelmed by guilt, ennui, and the ubiquity of evil, would have been intoxicated by Mestre's uncompromising and searing diction, not to mention sureness of footing in matters theological and in the ontology of evil. For if Mestre's style is grounded in antimetaboli, in contradiction and in Socratic give and take, the thesis never wavers. The master speaks and shows through syllogism and antinomies that the only truth is that of Christianity, which means Roman Catholic, and grounded in the most pessimistic take possible on original sin. The unremitting pessimism of his certainty clearly inspires Baudelaire, as of the continual binaries that infuse Mestre's dark gaze upon the world. One hears Mestrian echoes everywhere in Baudelaire, and not only concerning original sin. Man is also duplex in mess. There are two men in each man, one praising virtue, the other crime. Mestre writes that contradiction is to be found everywhere, quote, since the whole of the universe obeys the two forces. He writes that evil has sullied everything, and all of man is nothing but a sickness. He draws direct correlations between physical and moral ills. If there were no moral evil, he writes, there would be no disease. And of course, for that, we've got venereal disease from the age of 20, understood Mess to be speaking to him. Mess's theory of redemption through blood, very interesting, is almost Freudian in its notion of the threat of punishment to maintain civilization, of circumcision as a vestigial remains of sacrifice, of the basis of human connection with the divine. Anywhere you see an altar, Mess famously in turn intones, there you will find civilization. 
reminiscent of Freud too, as in Chopin and Taboo or Moses and Monotheism, is messed with the idea that the secondary crime after the fall, the crime that led to the flood, was so terrible that we cannot even imagine or remember it. We live in the memory only of guilt and the knowledge that we can never catch up to the golden age before the flood, including intellectually. Thus does Nestler tribalize, trying to follow Augustine in original sin, and double it as well, the fall then, the crime leading to the flood. If the first is inscribed in Genesis, the second is forever lost, along with the acumen man had once when, before God's anger reaped the flood, it's lost to consciousness, but not in this expunged. Now, let me just say for a few minutes something about Mesta's very alarming notion of reversibility, which had a very important effect on Bourdain. The righteous argues Mest in italics, in suffering voluntarily, satisfies not only for himself, but for the guilty one by way of reversibility. Mesler uses satisfy, satisfaire, in the less usual sense, meaning the fulfillment of an obligation, the payment of a debt. Reversibility is, he says, the faith of the universe. It is a system of checks and balances. Its economy is hydraulic. Again, the Freud of the topographical unconscious springs to mind. In thermodynamics, uh, reversibility is a process that can be inverted and attain the same outcome. <laughs> The system returned, uh, and then the system returned to its original state. In that sense, one might describe the arc of beyond the pleasure principle as a kind of reversibility. In its theological context for Met, reversibility obviously means the process by which original sin is harshly, unlike in Paul, reversed. Mess's entire discussion on reversibility seems to rely on uh, Romans. Uh, where Paul says, quote, for as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. Reversibility is supposed to work then in both directions, sin and grace. Mest, however, and his admirer Baudelaire seem only concerned with the former, that is to say, sin. It is frequently noted by critics that Baudelaire sees sin everywhere but no redemption. It is Mest, I am arguing, who is the inspiration for this harsh point of view. It should be added that the dominant question in the soirée seems largely taken from the same Romans 5, where the question of original sin, justice, and the righteous is constant. If Paul concentrates on reconciliation and exaltation in God, Mesta seems to smack his lips at God's vengeance and punishments. Reversibility has a monetary economy, right? You owe by heredity. You pay because even if you are innocent yourself, you have inherited sin. And when you pay, despite such innocence, you erase the debt of another guilty uh, party. Thus, within the Mestrian universe, it is because man is by nature evil that innocence can be no refuge from suffering. On the contrary, Mest says, men have always known that innocence will never satisfy crime, and they have moreover believed that there is an expiating force in blood such that life, which is blood, could ransom another life. And this, again, is the lexicon of debt and payment not to mention sacrifice. In this, the redemption can be provisionally bought with the, innocent spi the spilling of innocent blood. This is one aspect of mess that Baudelaire does not fully adopt. Redemption is at best unlikely and certainly foggy in him, and blood offers at best relief from ennui. What is sin without grace? We were asked at this conference the other day. For Baudelaire, it is the memory of a prelapsarian good and the illusion of the good in the parousia of beauty provided by art. The eminent scholar Pichois points out that reversibility itself is less and less used in Catholicism and, quote, has never been at the center of Catholic theology because of its juridical, uh, jur juridical, um, indeed mercantile slipperiness, which can make it dangerous. <laughs> 
end quote, dangerous perhaps, but telling in the mainstream context. The Unfinished Soiree were published in 1821, just after the author's death. Given the rise of, as we all know, industrialization, capitalism, and new urban centers, developments which must, of course, be loathed, it is worth noting the extent to which the lexicon of capitalism and of these changes in the fabric of European culture creep into Mesta's willfully ancien regime and pre-industrial perspective. Mest, of course, hates the French Revolution, but believes that God's hand is more evident there than in any other human event. If during the Revolution the divinity employs the vilest of instruments, it is only because it is punishing in order to regenerate. He adds that in the Revolution, quote, God is advancing to avenge the iniquity that the inhabitants of the world has committed against him. <clears throat> Mestre is then a scorched earth theology, one that sees punishment as necessary to set man aright, one that promises redemption through the blood of sacrifice, one that in monetary metaphors formulates original sin as a debt that can never be satisfied. So you can see the strange reading of Augustine. Uh, reversibility itself partakes in the economy of exchange, although, as we noted with Baudelaire's own notion of original sin, the evil that begins with the fall and is repeated by the crime that brings on the flood is so great for Mestre that expiation is impossible, even if redemption through blood seems in his text worth something like a better chance at the last judgment. Reversibility, then, is going, as it were, in the right direction in Mestre, but it will never really get back to the point of origin that would allow for an erasure of the fall, because the debt to repeat can never be satisfied. But the coin of that realm is blood, and, it strangely follows, is divine. The adjective divine, says the philosopher Cioran, is Mestre's favorite, modifying everything from the French Revolution to hereditary monarchy, the Constitution, and the Pope. He wrote a very important book on the Pope. Needless to say, reversibility is how Mest understands the crucifixion. Moreover, the murder of Louis XVI seems for Mest to be something like a distant reminder of that. Again, a sacrifice necessary for helping to reverse the sins of man. As Georges Bataille puts it, after having admiringly cited Mest, quote, when the executioner shows the head of the monarch to the crown, he is attesting to the perpetuation of crime. But at the same time, by baptizing the assembly with royal blood, he is communicating to that assembly the saintly virtue of the decapitated sovereign. That's that time. And Koslovsky at the Collège de Sociologie says that the moment the king's head is cut off, quote, it is the representative of God who is dying, and it is the blood of the temporal representative of God for Mess and other counter-revolutionary Catholic <coughs> philosophers. Louis expiates the sins of the nation. And Sioran writes in his introduction to an anthology of Nestor's works, I love this, the more one reads him, quote, the more one yearns for the delights of skepticism or for the urgency of a plea for heresy. <laughs> Baudelaire's poem, I mean, it's complicated because his views are very frightening, but he's also brilliant. Um, so anyway, the poem, uh, Reversibilité, Reversibility, 1850, Three is directly inspired in Baudelaire by Mesfa's grim view of that term and ends with the dying biblical David trying to sap an angel's strength. The angel of the poem is full of the joy of light, health, and beauty. This is for those of you who know Baudelaire, Madame Sabatier. In other words, guilty of too easy a happiness. David would take her innocence and health to save himself. While David is ready to deploy what Pichois calls the juridical and mercantile aspect of reversibility, the narrator is more generous, he points out to us, and would have, he said, asked only for intercession. Much like the scandalous poem in its time, The Litanies of Satan, the poem Reversibility uses <coughs> catechistic concepts and incantatory repetitions reminiscent of the mass in a context that disjoints expectation. Here, the angel is the woman whom the narrator loves, 
and the intercession he seeks from her is freedom from the pain of vices too powerful to allow for happiness and yet helpless to erase ennui. If Baudelaire admired Nest, let me just add in parentheses, the poet Vigny, on the other hand, vigorously attacked him, calling Nest a falsifying mind. Vigny vituperatively singles out precisely the fatal theory of reversibility and of redemption through blood, and accuses Nest of having found this theory in origin, who, as the new Bayard edition <coughs> of Baudelaire primly notes, that origin, quote, Origin did not, as we know, have the smell of sainthood. <laughs> Vigny's analogy with origin is in any case rather misleading because the notion of free will is quite absent in Mess. And more to the point is that Mess has uh, since Vigny been adopted, as I've been note- noting, by any number of uh, modern theorists. Uh, Mess, because of his the vehemence and intolerance and incomprehensibility, is he being ironic, asks the Oran, can he possibly mean this? And sheer excess, Batai is his descendant in this logic, is dubbed one of the forefathers of modernity by modernity itself. Masters also, also famously uses um, his hyper-Augustinianism for political purposes, of course. Um, which I don't have time to talk about, but I do think, I, I mean, I have the sense that Augustine would be rather worried by Mestre's notion of a heavy collaboration between God and kings by divine right. The elision, in other words, of the earthly and heavenly realms, such as one renders to God by way of and with bakshish to Caesar. Mestre's is a consistently anti-enlightenment stance, indeed, Horkheimer and Adorno may dismiss him as, quote, a true son of the church, if ever there was one, but they obviously feel compelled to allude to him, even if mainly for the purpose of deriding his very clear misogyny. There is something of Mestre that appeals to a later age, the same age that wants to call Baudelaire modern, and it is not pretty. It is not by chance that Isaiah Berlin describes Mestre as looking with a proto-fascist gaze, Mess the sees man is filled, as Berlin put it, with black instincts that nothing will ever finally quell, and with original sin, which nothing can ultimately exterminate. So Mess the two, as Berlin notes, swings between two extremes, on the one side extreme punishment and terror, on the other side chaos. As Mestre himself puts it, quote, God, who is the author of sovereignty, is also that of punishment. He has cast our earth upon these two poles, and then in italics, for Jehovah is the master of the two poles, and on them he makes the world turn. Again, one senses here that Baudelaire's attraction to mess is uh, based on, on, on this notion of um, the two poles, and not only because of the mainstream formulations of the world, there's also the little matter of terror and punishment, which interested in Baudelaire as well. I'm now in my, nearing my conclusion. Um, I'm going to say briefly that any biography, and God knows there have been a lot of them, of of, uh, Baudelaire, uh, gets all excited about his extremely unhappy relationship with his severe and unforgiving stepfather, the General Opic, and the fact that in the revolution of 1848, Baudelaire was rather confused politically, was seen to run out saying, we have to shoot the General Opic. Um, but, you know, there is here uh, an interesting aspect. Punishment for Baudelaire is patriarchal of origin, whether it's opique or God. And one senses that the crime of humanity, to which Mestre so often refers, that crime was so terrible that we've forgotten it, is for Baudelaire, as it would be for Freud, a patricide. What is original sin, after all, if not disobeying the father? There is throughout the Baudelaire corpus the desire to escape patriarchal law, though the revolt is usually, as if in a parody of Swedenborg, the same system in reverse. Mirror. O Satan is in Baudelaire a prayer to the patriarch of a different realm, but a potent one nonetheless. The last lines of the poem refer to Satan as a, quote, adoptive father, as against God the Father. <laughs> 
Rebellion in Baudelaire, more often than not, recapitulates blind obedience as a mirror image. The litanies to Satan invert the mass, and the prayer praises the devil. But we do not need deconstruction to recognize that it is the same economy of male power and sovereignty. And the poem in Baudelaire, quote, the, uh, that's called The Denial of St. Peter, as that poem savagely puts it, God is like a tyrant gorged on meat and wine, falling asleep to the sweet sounds of our hideous blasphemies. There is no question in Baudelaire that man is a sinner, but it is equally clear that God is a despot who considers the sobs of martyrs and condemned criminals in, quote, an intoxicating symphony. Here, needless to say, Baudelaire parts ways with Augustine and Mestre, but retains his Boudon. Certainly, Mestre's take on evil can only have resonated with the poet who, despite being one of the first, but not the first, to use the term modernity and modern, was not himself entirely a modern. As Sioran himself admits, Baudelaire uses Mestre to fuel his own obsessions and overturns Maestrian motifs by intensifying them and giving them the characteristic of lived negativity. Before he read Mest, Baudelaire already had a kind of what he called Satanism in place. The long verse prayer to Satan that I've mentioned, the litanies of Satan, is an inverted liturgy with the poet serving as priest in his recitation of invocation. The antiphonic structure, O Satan, take pity on my misery, as in, O Lord, hear our prayer, followed by outright prayer, mimes even as it overturns the structure of the Mass. The poem may have been written as early as 1848, but Satanism, as Lillian applies the term, increasingly becomes a literal and narrow reading of mess. If evil is all we can depend on, then it follows that it is stronger than the good, and its lord is therefore master. There is a certain bleak irony in Baudelaire here. But if the concrete thinking the later Baudelaire chooses to perform on Mestre's text is meant to shock, it is also a cry of despair. It is always already too late in Baudelaire, as it is in, for example, Kafka. Given the pervasiveness of antinomies and contradiction and dualities in Baudelaire, it's not surprising that he was attracted not only to Mestre's strength and purpose, which Baudelaire famously lacked, but also to his dialectical style and finally to his apparent certainty, certainty and dark take on reality and humanity. Mestre, in other words, helped give the grounding to Baudelaire's abstract notions on evil and makes of Baudelaire's tormenting antinomies a theological politics of inevitability. So here's my conclusion. It is through Mess that Baudelaire finds a way to sublate dualities and contradiction. The mere fact that he felt the need to synthesize antinomies, even if by the ineluctability of evil, shows, much as his choice of Mess as mentor, the extent to which Baudelaire was becoming less radical in the last decade of his life. Evil in Baudelaire is like a black hole that sucks everything into its vortex. And contradiction, as I've been saying throughout this talk, is a dialectic of falsehood, since evil will always already prevail. And here, too, we can see traces of Augustine. In City of God, 18 of Book 11, Augustine tries to relegate contradiction, you will recall, to mere rhetorical choreography. Quote, what are called antitheses, he says, are among the most elegant of the ornaments of speech. They might be called in Latin oppositions or, to speak more accurately, contrapositions. In Corinthians 2, Augustine tells us Paul makes graceful use of antitheses. These oppositions of language, Augustine tells us, uh, I might add they're rather terrifying oppositions. We're talking about dying and living, evil and good, known and unknown, hardly little stylistic flourishes. These oppositions, writes Augustine, quote, lend beauty to the language, so the beauty of the course of this world is achieved by the opposition of contraries arranged, not by an eloquence of words, but of things. And so, ah, so now we have reached things in Augustine. We're not merely describing tasteful turns of phrase. But it turns out, finally, that we're not talking about things either. 
Good is said is set against evil, says Augustine, quoting from Ecclesiastes, and life against death. So the sinner against the godly. These binaries, these are the beauties of the course of this world, as he puts it. Certainly such contradictions allow for a domestic following Augustine to preach his grim views. And Baudelaire, following this, in turn, and veering off of it, finds in contradiction the symptoms and power of evil, as we have noted. Augustine, however, does not emphasize the terrorizing possibilities of his antinomy. And in closing his chapter, he ends with a biblical passage in a way that seems to return to Baudelaire's dueling two persons, but with the implication that it is all right. Augustine. The contradictions make God's ordinance even more luminous. Contra malum bonum est et contra monum vita, sic contra pium peccator, et sic mentuere in omnis opera altissimi, bina bina unum contra unum. Wonderful passage. Perhaps it is the ethos of modernity that makes such a statement terrifying rather than reassuring. One against one in Baudelaire signals not the beauty of contradiction, but the power of evil, so pervasive that it presents itself as struggling to overcome its opposite, even as it knows it has already won. Herein, I believe, I believe lies a frightening and indeed moralistic vision of the flowers of evil for the poet, the one usurping endlessly the other's share. Thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.